Hey, remember when you knew nothing about your favorite video game? That first time you booted up the game and everything was completely brand new to you? Gameplay experiences now memorized, yet to be played. Cutscenes and plot points etched into your brain, yet to be absorbed. It's a time that not many people really think back on once they're hundreds or even thousands of hours into any given game. It also might just very well be impossible to look back on once you sat down and learned the language that video games speak in. Let's say you played Titanfall 2 as your first ever PC FPS game. If you then picked up Call of Duty afterwards, you could reasonably assume that W is forwards, S is backwards, A left, D right, control or C is presumably crouch, spacebar is jump, and shift is more times than not a button to sprint. This universal game control language carries over to console as well, and spans multiple genres across every single console and PC on the market. If you're playing an FPS game on console, you can assume that the right trigger shoots your gun. If you're playing a racing game, that same trigger acts like a gas pedal to move your car forwards. Move into platformers and the A button on Xbox, or the X for PlayStation, or B for Nintendo, is your jump button. This language isn't restricted to just control schemes across game genres, it extends to the general game design across multiple genres of games. In games with expansive levels, Levels, developers need to find a way to guide the player intuitively, so the path you need to go towards might be brighter than things around it. Have a blinking light to indicate the correct door, or in Halo 3 ODST's case, literally write in an AI that directs you where you need to go. The point of all this isn't to talk about game design language. There's a wonderful video by Razpaten that goes much more in depth than I do on this topic. It's to remind you that at one point, you didn't know the language of video games. Inadvertently, depending on the type of game you're playing, you being ignorant to the language and design choices in the game can be a much more enjoyable experience. For competitive multiplayer shooters like CSGO, the more you get into the game, the more likely you are to find enjoyment, maybe a better word is fulfillment, out of the game once you've learned map callouts and spray patterns to play the game as it was intended. But for a game like Minecraft, wouldn't you agree the game had quite the charm to it back when surviving your first night was actually a pretty big deal? While you might disagree, depending on how your first night went, I survived mine, thank you very much, I can definitely say that I found games much more interesting back when I had no clue that people made games for a job. I can vividly remember my first playthrough of Pokemon Soul Silver, and because I had no clue about budget restraints, time restrictions, or hardware limitations, seeing an entirely separate region in the game for me to explore was a crazy-ass surprise. It made me wonder just how much more there was in the game for me to explore special events that have yet to trigger, or maybe there's even a third region that I could travel to. There wasn't, by the way. But this type of speculation took a while for me to grow out of. Countless hours spent playing Halo 3, playing through campaign missions again and again and again and again just to see if anything would change. That maybe if I was a bit faster I could save the Pelicans in the first mission. Hell, I spent hours just staring at skyboxes and forge maps wondering what was beyond the confines of the game. Obviously, I'm now keenly aware of exactly how games are made. I've watched countless documents documentaries explaining the ins and outs of making some of my favorite games. Even sat down and watched a few videos firsthand that show me exactly what's beyond the limits of a game. And more often than not, it's nothing. Empty voids, developer textures, yeah, you might see the occasional easter egg or misplaced item, but it doesn't get rid of the fact that whenever I load up a game, I have a relatively good idea of just where and how far I'm able to go. Elden Ring was such a shock to me because of just how much game there was for me to explore. I was so enthralled by the concept of seeing these beautiful, massive landscapes and buildings in the skybox and then actually being able to go there and explore the areas that I thought would just be backdrops. I knew going into the game that it was an open world, but the fact that the game just kept going and going before I stopped playing kept me wondering just when the game would tell me that I can't go any further. But even when a game outright does tell me that I simply cannot go further, there's still a small part of me that wonders if there's a way to get there later in the game. I mean, hell, I'm not alone here. Pokemon straight up tells you, hey idiot, you can't walk out into the tall grass without a Pokemon. 7.1 million people, me included, still wants to see what happens anyway. Going back to the beginning of the video, someone's first introduction to a game is so such an integral experience that I wish I could relive to get an idea of just what it was like for my favorite franchises. Aside from how cool it would be to experience the story of Halo 2 again without having memorized nearly every line, it would make my job of recommending it to people so much easier. As a content creator, I need to keep in mind what it's like for someone playing a game for the first time whenever I recommend something. And with Halo as a franchise in its entirety, it's pretty much impossible for me to do that. Except like Halo Infinite, because that one was really recent. Sometimes it's also nearly impossible to play a classic well-renowned game without already knowing what happens because of just how influential those games, or their plot points, were to the industry. I got to Portal 1 and 2 before I was ever spoiled, but with games like Half-Life 1 and 2, Final Fantasy 7, and Modern Warfare 1 and 2, I wasn't so lucky. It's unfortunate too, because taking Modern Warfare 1 and 2 as an example here, some of these moments won't hit as hard as it did to people who first played the games back in 2007 and 2009. I'm thankful that I'm at least unaware as to how both of these games end, but the shock of no Russian is kinda out the window. 
speaking of first experiences, I already talked about Minecraft's first night, so I won't get into the nitty gritty details here, but there's a lot of universal firsts I could list off here that can never really be experienced for the first time ever again. This isn't a mark against Minecraft, literally my fault for playing the game too damn much, but there's no more secrets left for me to find in the game. I just know too much. Memorized every single crafting recipe, except for the fucking repeater. I'm really not sure how I fuck this up every time, but here we are. A lot of people have simply played Minecraft too much. It's the number one best-selling game of all time, arguably the most popular game of all time. The amount of content going over Easter eggs or secrets or experiences have all been made and consumed. There's very few things I could show someone that they didn't know was already in Minecraft, especially me. I mean, an experience that maybe not everyone can relate with, but something I experienced was making my first Aether portal. For anyone unaware, the Aether is a dimension in Minecraft that's located in the sky. It features new blocks, mobs, and bosses unique to the dimension. You can reach the Aether by creating a nether portal out of glowstone instead and using a bucket of water to light the portal. The issue is that the Aether doesn't exist in Minecraft. It's a mod, not a dimension that was ever in the base game. Seeing these YouTubers make this portal and then travel to a sick new dimension was wild to me. It all seems so simple. Instead of obsidian, you use glowstone. How did I not think of this? My disappointment when I stared at the portal, water pushing me away from a monument to my stupidity, I'll never live it down. This isn't to say that you can't have any experiences in gaming anymore that aren't unique. Our solution to this issue is variety. Gaming experiences can always stay new the more you branch out and try things entirely different from what you've played previously. And hell, even if you really think you know as much as there is to know about every single genre of game out there, there's games built around the idea that the person playing them has this knowledge. The Stanley Parable makes an entire joke about this. Making sure they understand basic, first-person video game mechanics and filling them in on the history of narrative tropes in video gaming so that the irony and insightful commentary of this game is not lost on them. And while games in the future might really become these limitless sandboxes that you can explore infinitely, able to anticipate every single outcome someone has, I can be content knowing that, even though I won't be able to go back and relive playing my favorite game ever for the very first time, I could always find a new favorite game ever and experience that for the very first time. If you enjoyed the video, click on another to continue watching my channel, subscribe to know when I post another, and comment what it was like to play your favorite game ever for the first time.